How many of you have some family or some friends, you can just put your hand up if you do, that are directly impacted by what's been going on in Florida and up the coast? Anybody have some family and friends? You do? Yeah. A lot of people. We had some families, uh, first service, uh, one of the families, their, their son, they haven't heard from in a couple of days because the power's out, cell towers are out, and they're not sure, you know, what's going on. So uh, I've got a friend that lives, he's a pastor in Port Ritchie, and it's uh, about a half hour, I think, north of Tampa. And their church is okay. Their church didn't get flooded, but uh, it's on a little more elevation. And around their church, we have our Inspire meetings from my national ministerium at his church every, every year, and it's up a little higher than the communities around. He's got about three different um, trailer parks around him, and they're destroyed. Uh, people in his church, they've lost their homes, they've lost their cars. Uh, it's just, it's been really tough for a lot of people, obviously. So I know that's affecting uh, people that you and I care about, maybe even people that I'm sure that we have never met and maybe never will, uh, but I thought it would be good for us to just take a moment. Let's pray over, uh, all over these people and their needs that only, only God is able to touch. Uh, before I do that, in the days, weeks ahead, our national fellowship is organizing some, some relief stuff. And, and maybe for some of us, that'll mean we'll, we'll give some money. Uh, maybe for some other of us, that'll mean going down to help uh, with some things. As soon as I get more information, we'll make that information available to you on how we can collectively help those uh, in our family of churches that are being affected by this, okay? So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your love, kindness. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your strength. Lord, I pray over those that maybe there have been some families that have lost loved ones. There's families that have lost all of their earthly possessions, uh, families that aren't sure what tomorrow is going to look like. So I pray over them. I ask that you would meet their needs that you would draw their hearts close to you, that the church, the Christians that are in those areas would be able to rise up and find tangible ways to demonstrate love and compassion uh, and, and have inroads to people's hearts with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we'll just thank you so much for what you will accomplish even in difficult days. I uh, thank you, Lord, for your graciousness. I thank you that we are able to worship together this morning. Uh, in the facility that you have provided for us. We give you all the glory for that, and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Every week, we, one of the staff, either at the end or the beginning, we remind each other that we exist as a church for a purpose, that we exist as a church because we want to help people live Jesus-centered lives, and we don't just say it to fill time. That is our purpose. That is our mission. We remind each other of that as a reminder that we are not a book club at the library. That's not why we gather. That's not who we are. Nothing wrong with a book club at a library necessarily, but that's not why we are gathered here this morning. We are not a civic organization that meets at the Moose Lodge. That's not who we are. Now, we have some pretty sweet moose antlers uh, mounted over in the, in the Grace Kids area. If you haven't seen them, they are impressive. But that's not why we are gathered. We are gathered together as a group of followers of Jesus Christ. We want to worship God and we want to help other people meet Jesus and experience his love. And so we hope that you invite more and more people to join you so that he, they can hear the gospel of Jesus and have their lives transformed. We want that to happen and we want to ask people to join us in this journey that we're on. If you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior, you and I, we are on a journey together to learn what it means, what it looks like to follow Jesus, to embrace his ways, to, to live life in such a way that would honor God. And uh, that's something that we get to do together and spur each other on as, uh, as Deb prayed in her prayer. And we also gather together to, to gain courage so that we can share his story. We want people to meet Jesus, learn how to follow Jesus, and then as we grow, we want to be able to share his story with others so more and more people can come to know Christ. This is why we, this is why we gather. We want to worship God. We want to help each other live a Jesus-centered life. Now, I wanted to focus in on one word, though. When we talk about living a Jesus-centered life, we, we use this word, we want to help each other. Why, why do we need to help? Because, you know, 
living a Jesus-centered life is easy, right? It's, it's the easiest thing in the world to live a Jesus-centered life. John 14, would you look at this with me? We're going to look at the Holy Spirit this morning as Jesus is going to teach us some things about the Holy Spirit. But it's interesting on the way there, we're going to look at a few things in chapter 14, 15, and 16. As Jesus talks to us, teaches us about the Holy Spirit. But before he gets to all of that, in the middle of it, he gives this command uh, to us as believers, and he repeats it. As if we didn't hear, or as, as if we missed it. Probably more so in the case if it just needs to be emphasized. If you go to John 14, look at verse 15. It says, if Jesus is saying this, if you love me, if you love me, Obey my, my commandments. If you love me, you will obey me. That's what Jesus said. Okay. Well, then verse 21, he repeats it. He says, those who accept my commandments and obey them, they are the ones who love me. So it's repeated. And he says it again in verse 23. All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone, here's the reverse side of this, anyone who does not love me will not obey me. Why would Jesus repeat this within the span of, what, under 10 verses, says the same thing three, four times. If you love me, obey me. There's obviously something he's trying to emphasize to us. When we trust Jesus as our forgiver of sin, when we trust him as our savior from hell, uh, it does not automatically mean that following Jesus becomes easy. Now, some may think that that is how it goes. Maybe you've met people that uh, when they think of Christianity, they think, oh, you know, you, you come to know Jesus and then automatically all of your problems disappear. That's not been my experience. Or uh, you begin to follow Jesus and, uh, you know, you, 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 you get baptized, you start following Christ, and then you go to the bank that week and out of nowhere your bank account has just tripled, right, because now you're a Christian, so now you must be rich. It's not in my experience. And, and, and sometimes there's this misconception that because you have decided to follow Christ and you have decided uh, to begin living out a biblical worldview that you just maybe assume well, everybody's going to be excited about that. All of, your, all of your unbelieving friends and family members, they're going to be super jazzed for you and cheer you on, and that's not always the case. Well, wouldn't it be nice if after we said amen, dear Lord, you know, we asked, we repent of our sin, we ask Jesus to come into our life and, and transform us and, and bring the Holy Spirit into our, our lives. Wouldn't it be nice if when we opened our eyes after we said amen, all of our sinful desires evaporated just like that? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be nice? Living a Jesus-centered life is not easy. It's why the Apostle Paul urges believers in Romans chapter 12. He uses that word, I urge you, believers, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. He says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. He's, he's begging the believer not to conform to the value system, the worldview of the secular world that we live in. Instead, he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's begging believers to experience, to pursue change. Why the strong encouragement? It should be easy, right? Well, change is not easy, especially when it comes to the spiritual level. In Romans chapter 6, Paul makes the point that God's grace is not 
an excuse to just continue on in sin. The reality for us is we live in a world that still tempts our eyes with lust, that still tempts our, our, our hearts with jealousy. Paul would later describe the Christian life in terms of warfare. Now, I have not personally been in combat or in warfare, but I've seen, uh, I think, enough uh, depictions of that on, on television, in movies, to understand that it's not easy it looks awful. And, and Paul paints this, this image of, the, of our spiritual lives in the context of a battle, of, a, a, of warfare. And he says, we need to put on the full armor of God because it's not easy to live a Jesus-centered life. And it's not, it's not just the internal battles of, of pride and jealousy, and selfishness. You know, these are internal battles that you and I face every day, but it's also external battles. Threats that come at us on the spiritual level that make living a Jesus-centered life difficult at times, challenging. For example, most of us, now there's probably one or two in, in the room that aren't like this, but I think most of us want to be liked most of us, if we had our choice, would prefer to be accepted by the people that we work with or the people that we go to school with. And sometimes what happens if we stand on a biblical worldview, whether it's uh, in our life choices or on our stance on certain issues, the, the, the people around us that do not accept a biblical worldview who believe that the Bible is irrelevant or untrue, boy, it, this is not the path to acceptance with them. And that can, be, that can be hard to be pushed out of the group, to be rejected or made fun of. That, that, that can be difficult. I've noticed these commercials on TV lately that have been advocating abortion and framing it in such a way as abortion is a good moral value. That's how it's being framed. And, and those who would have a pro-life conviction are being framed as the morally corrupt. And for a lot of Christians, that makes them uncomfortable. You don't want, you don't want to be seen as mean or hateful or, or somehow morally corrupt. But you have to remember where that viewpoint, where that worldview is coming from. The root of that, you can go all the way back to the time of Charles Darwin. There was um, a scientist, uh, I always pronounce this name incorrectly, er Ernst Haeckel. I'm probably not got his name correct there, but uh, a scientist that was an atheist, an evolutionist, and he was, uh, he was trying to promote the evolutionary theory when it comes to embryos, the development of the unborn child. And in doing so, he made drawings. Let me, let me say it again. He made drawings of the development of what was called an, an, an embryo. And these drawings depicted the development of an embryo in that it went through the evolutionary process from cells to a fish to an amphibian to a reptile and so forth. And eventually it became a human. Now, in case you missed it, he did not use high-definition sonogram. He made drawings, cartoons, and he was able to convince people that this was what was happening in the womb. It's a lie. It was demonstrated to be untrue. It's not, it's not the development process. And yet, that lie persists. And it's being told today that it's, it's okay to abort a child early on because it's not human. That's where the lie comes from. 
Margaret Sanger was an atheist and a terrible, hate-filled racist. She was the founder of Planned Parenthood. Her whole goal in, in founding Planned Parenthood, which you're aware they are the, the leading uh, proponents of abortion and its value system, her whole goal was to decrease the black population. That's why she was doing what she was doing. As a Christian, I understand what God's Word teaches in Genesis and in Jeremiah and Psalm 139 that the sanctity of the unborn life is truth. But even if you don't understand the Word of God, you can still go back in history to find out where these ideas came from. They came from atheists. Why would I accept that as truth? They came from racists. Why would I be okay with that world philosophy? I think sometimes what happens is, as Christians, we want to be loving and kind and respectful, and we should be. And there are, there are people who find themselves in difficult situations and circumstances, and they, they deserve love and kindness and respect and help. But we also have to make sure that we, that we rely on the Word of God whenever we are searching for what is true. The viability of life somehow got disconnected from the soul. It's one example of many how the secular culture that we live in demands that Christians conform to its worldview. A worldview that rejects the existence of God, a worldview that rejects the truthfulness of His Word. And if we desire acceptance more than truth, we will fall prey. We'll compromise, we'll conform. Living a Jesus centered life is not easy. If only we had some divine supernatural help to help us live a Jesus-centered life. Well, the great news is that we do. And this morning, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, Jesus introduces us to him. If you go back there with me, we're going to jump back into verse 16. In chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus describes the Holy Spirit with two different titles. The first title that we're going to see is that of counselor. Depending on the the version that you have with you this morning, you might have the word counselor, you might have the word advocate. If you have the word counselor, just understand that it's not like a therapist. It's not like you go to counseling to visit your therapist. That's not how this word is being used. It's that of an advocate, like a legal advocate in a courtroom who stands beside you and helps you in a time of trouble. That's the image of the counselor or the advocate. The other title, the other descriptor that Jesus uses of the Holy Spirit is that of the Spirit of Truth. He is the one, as we will see, who guides us to truth, who reveals truth, who helps us, gives us strength and courage to live out truth. John chapter 14, verse 16. Let's just read through some of these descriptions. Jesus describes here, uh, after he says, if you love me, obey my commandments, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate, another meaning one of the same kind. Jesus was there alongside them, giving them strength and comfort and guidance. Jesus is going back to heaven after his death and resurrection. He says, I'm going to send another advocate of the same kind. Talking about the Holy Spirit. Who, listen to this, who will never leave you. That's important. This advocate, this counselor will be with us always. He will never leave us. Verse 17 says, the Holy Spirit leads into all truth. Well, that's important. 
The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him. It doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Verse 26, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you, teaching us. Reminding us of the truth of the word of God. Chapter 15, verse 26. I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth, and he will will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. Verse 27. You must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. Chapter 16, verse 8. When he comes, who? The advocate, this counselor, the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of the world has already been judged. This is what the Holy Spirit convicts the hearts of unbelievers, the truth of the gospel, their need of sin, the righteousness of Christ, the judgment uh, that comes from not believing. This is the role of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 13 Verse 13 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He goes on to talk about specifically to these disciples how uh, the spirit will remind them, and and certainly that was true of, of everything that Jesus did and said as they wrote the gospels. He goes on also to say that he'll reveal the future. Specifically, John is the one who wrote the book of Revelation, Uh, So that particular verse was directed at uh, those men and and the Apostle Paul, but the the bigger point of, of that verse is that the Spirit guides, reveals, and guides us to truth. That's who the Holy Spirit is. That's what he does. So if we take, we take what Jesus taught us about the Holy Spirit, and we think about how we might apply that to our lives today, tomorrow, this week, The first place that I think we want to start would be the fact that the Holy Spirit is always with us. If the Holy Spirit is always with us, that means that we are never alone. If the Holy Spirit is always with us, that means we are never alone. I wonder if you have ever felt lonely I wonder if even today there is some part of you that feels very much alone and it may be because you are walking through something that is so unbelievably difficult that you wonder if anyone understands. I don't think anybody gets it and you feel perhaps alone in your pain, alone in your Sorrow, like no one, no one could possibly relate. The Lord understands, and he has sent the Holy Spirit to always be with you, so he understands you're not alone. It's also possible that some of you feel alone because you have been pushed aside, You don't get, because of your decision to follow Christ, to to live out a biblical worldview, you don't get invites to the party. You're you're not part of the cool cool crowd. You don't get uh, the offer to come over and sit at the lunch table anymore. You've been ghosted on social media, and it hurts, and you feel perhaps alone Some of you, I don't, we have some college students. I don't know if some of them are home on, uh, for the weekend right now, but we, we have college students that go to uh, secular colleges and, and, 
unless they're connected with some Christians, maybe through crew or FCA or something like that, to be at a secular college as a Christian can, I'm sure, I can only imagine, has moments when you feel just alone. But if the Spirit of God is always with us, then we are never alone. He is always with us to give us strength, to give us courage, to give us comfort. All we have to do is ask, and he will supply. That's important. I need that in my life. I need that confidence. Something else Jesus revealed about the Holy Spirit is this, that the Holy Spirit guides us into truth. That means that the truth can be discovered. The truth is something that we can always discover. It's not as though we have to wander around through life aimlessly hoping we trip over the truth at some point, which is sometimes how it feels in our culture today Language and, and, and truth has been so distorted to the point where it's like, I don't know who to trust. I don't know, I don't, I don't know what is up and down. I hope I stumble over truth at some point. Maybe you love these commercials on TV. I've had enough of the political commercials. I've had enough. Yeah? Whew. Some of you are like, I love them, they're the best, whatever. Okay, that's fine if you do. And, and the point of bringing them up is not so that, you know, grab my hand, we're going to jump into the hole of despair together this morning. That's not what I want to do with this, not where I'm, where I'm going. I just, I've had to turn them off or mute them because I, I can't emotionally take being lied to over and over again. I, I want truth. And what I have noticed is this. I have noticed that atheists, secular humanists who reject the existence of God, who reject the authority of the Word of God, the reliability and the truthfulness of God's Word, have taken over science, taken over culture, and the secular atheist worldview is, is what is, uh, is being communicated that we as Christians, are supposed to bow down to and conform to if we want to be accepted. And I think along the way, I think there have been a lot of uh, Christians along the way that have decided, yes, I want to be accepted, I want to be liked, therefore I will conform. And so I'm hoping this morning to challenge your heart, to encourage your heart to stop allowing the atheistic humanist worldview to distort your view of what is right and wrong. We have been given the truth of what is right and what is wrong. I, I, I don't need the humanist or the atheist to tell me my value system. I've already been given it by God. I would like to encourage your heart challenge your heart as Christians to commit yourself to test every idea, every philosophy, every argument with the truth of the Word of God. This is what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, we are human. That's true. We are human. But we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons. To do what? To knock down the strongholds of human reasoning. To destroy false arguments. To, to destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We, we capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. And after you have become fully obedient, we will punish everyone who remains disobedient. This is the Word of God that tells us not to conform to the worldview of our culture. Second Timothy 3.16 reminds us that all Scripture is God-breathed. This is the Word of of God. Therefore, it is useful to us. It teaches us. It corrects us. It rebukes us. It teaches us how to live a righteous life. It is valuable to us because of that. 
we, we don't have to, I know it, it seems sometimes like we got language that means nothing anymore, and what sh- should be right is seen as wrong, what should be wrong is seen as right. It, it can be very confusing if we don't have the word of God. And, we do, and, and I guess my encouragement to you is when, when you feel confused, take a breath and remember, you and I as believers, we're not, we don't have to walk through life aimlessly hoping at some time we bump into the truth or stumble over it accidentally. We simply have to trust that the word of God contains truth and ask the Holy Spirit to help us discover it, understand it, and live it. And he'll do that. He'll help us. The Holy Spirit is always with us, so I'm, I'm never alone. The Holy Spirit guides us into truth, so I can have confidence into what is, what is truly right and wrong. And here's the third description of the Holy Spirit that, the, that Jesus gives us. He says the Holy Spirit convicts the hearts of unbelievers. Well, If the Holy Spirit convicts the hearts of unbelievers, then when it comes to sharing our faith, when it comes to sharing uh, what we believe about Christ and the gospel with others, we we don't have to feel like we're selling a product. We're just sharing a story. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts hearts and, and changes lives. That's not our role. Our role is to simply share the story. He talks about in, uh, in verse 27, it was, of chapter 14, he, he says, uh, I'm going to, the Holy, uh, Holy Spirit testifies about who Jesus is, and he says, I need you, I'm um, commanding you to also testify who I am. And then in Matthew 28, uh, the command before Jesus went back to heaven, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teach them to obey everything I have commanded. Well, if, it was, if that command was just to those disciples, well, that whole thing would have died out in one generation. So it's, that command obviously extends to us to share our faith, to help people meet Jesus. But I think sometimes Christians get intimidated or scared or, uh, or shy about their faith, maybe because they're afraid they'll be rejected, maybe because they feel like they don't know enough or that uh, they're not gonna win some, some debate over religion Back away from from that fear and just realize it's the Holy Spirit who convicts people's hearts. He does the spiritual level work in people's lives. We are just called to share our story. We're not selling a product. What did Jesus do in your life? What is Jesus doing in your life? That's an important story that people need to hear. Living a Jesus-centered life is certainly not always easy. Jesus told us this in John 15, verse 18. Listen to this. Jesus said, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. If the world would love you, or the world would love you, as one of its own, if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world, I chose you to come out of the world. Listen to this. That is why the world hates you. And and maybe that bothers you. But as Jesus said multiple times here in chapter 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. If the Holy Spirit is always with us, it means we're never alone. If the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, it means that we can discover truth and know what is right and know what our values and priorities should be with confidence. If the Holy Spirit convicts the heart of unbelievers, well, I don't have to sell a product or try to uh, manipulate a conversation. I just, have to share, I just have to share the story of Jesus. I wonder, as we think about maybe what we're going to take from this and, and live out today and this week, I wonder if there's one of those maybe that resonated with you more than others. If you have been feeling alone, if you have been feeling lonely in 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 your pain or in your life because others have been pushing you aside, if you have been feeling like that, my my encouragement would be take some time today in prayer, even before you leave this place, take some time today in prayer and just ask the Holy Spirit to remind you of his presence in your life, how how much you are loved by God and that you are not alone.
If you've been compromising the truth of God's word in some area of your life, the challenge would be to recommit yourself to discovering the truth of God's word and asking the Holy Spirit to guide you into truth and to give you the courage to live it out. And if you have been reluctant to live a Jesus-centered life, to share your faith story with others, could I just gently and humbly remind you of what is at stake if we don't? The people that we love, the people that we care about, our friends, our family, our neighbors, even those that we don't know. Without Jesus, when they step from this life into the next, they will step into eternity separated from God forever. That should matter to us. And I pray that God would break our hearts for those who need to hear the story of Jesus. And he would give us courage. It's a pretty great story. What's, what's Jesus been doing in your life? Giving you confidence, giving you hope, giving you strength, rescuing your soul from hell. This is a pretty great story. I pray that God will give us courage to share it with those who need to hear it. Let me take some time and pray over us as a church family. Lord, thank you for your love, your kindness, your grace. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, the gift of your Holy Spirit. Lord, Every day, I am reminded just how desperately I need the ministry of your Holy Spirit. I, I need you to fill my heart with love. I, I need you to fill my heart with joy and peace and patience. I, I need you, Lord, to fill my life with goodness and gentleness. I desperately need the strength of the Spirit to give me self-control. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Forgive us, Lord, where we have tried to do life on our own, where we have tried to do life in our own strength and power. Bring us back, Lord, as believers, back into this place of a realization of all the power and strength that you provide through this gift of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, if there is someone here today in this room that needs to take that step of faith in Jesus Christ as their forgiver of sin, their savior from hell, the Lord of their life, the transformer of their soul, Lord, I pray today in these moments that you have given us now, today, that they would take that step of faith and trust in you. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.